Anything a cop needs, he calls us, but he can't handle himself. Somebody drops their keys down the sewer, they call us. Somebody needs to gain entry to an apartment to get somebody that's sick out of the apartment, they call us. We get it done. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. We just can't say, sorry, we don't handle that. Sorry, we're not going to do it. Sorry, call somebody else. We get it done. Candidates for the emergency service unit are chosen out of thousands of applications of thousands of police officers to come to a highly trained, highly skilled tactical and rescue unit. When you become a police officer, your motivation to become an emergency service cop is its pretty much the motto that cops are there to help the civilians, emergency service officers are there to help the cops who need a hand when they can't handle something. When things got really hairy, you know, these guys came in and they, you know, very calm and cool and collected, and they went about their business. And without fanfare, they, they went and they, you know, they completed it, which was great. Um, and you know, you looked at them and they were like, you know, you know, this was the place to come to come and uh, and really kind of do, you know, like wild police work. The workhorse of the division is the REP, which is the smaller of the two. The, uh, the heavy rescue or the big truck, or it's, it's termed a few things by different people, but it is a larger vehicle carrying some of the same equipment that could be utilized for any and all applications of the postal service that we receive. We have everything from a Hearst rescue tool to get people out of motor vehicles when they're trapped after a collision. We have scuba equipment. We have small hand tools from screwdrivers to pliers and all those other things, including an elevator kit. So we have just about everything we need, including animal control, um, water rescue equipment, just, a, just what we would need in the immediate call to service in the initial stages. And then the other vehicle, the, the, the big truck will come in with the supervisor and with additional equipment help us to accomplish the goal. Because it is such a highly trained unit, you gotta kinda be, be together and tight with things. You're up on the top of a bridge somewhere and you need to know that the guy next to you knows what he's doing holding that rope. Well, you can't do, you know, the, the initial, may say, rescue. I mean, that's only just a small part of it and you have to have this type of um, atmosphere to keep that going. The guys here on a routine basis make things that are difficult look very easy. Basically, everyone's been trained the same here, so, uh, if one guy falls short in one area, there's always someone that can fill the gap. And that's, that's basically, uh, yeah, this probably makes it a lot easier for a supervisor because he knows top. everybody here is, is trained to the same capabilities. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm part of the emergency service unit, which is uh, one small component of the, of the New York City Police Department. Uh, it's about 400 officers in 10 uh, sections citywide that help uh, our officers uh, complete any assignment that they encounter, anything from tactics to uh, rescue jobs. And our job is to help make sure that the officer can uh, do his job. Regular precinct patrol officer may happen across, a, you know, respond to a 9-11 call for service and then uh, may need uh, extra assistance, either in equipment or expertise, and that's where he will call for one of our units who will respond and help him complete his assignment. And uh, that those entail anything from tactics, which re would require special weapons or, um, or special uh, equipment uh, in a tactical type of situation.
The difference between ESU and patrol is uh, patrol calls ESU when they have a condition that they can't handle by themselves. That condition could be any number of things from a car accident where somebody's pinned to uh, somebody jumping off of the bridge or uh, off of one of the buildings. A lot of things that we do here that a lot of cops will say I would never do. You know, it's a elite group here. You know, a lot of guys here are very hard workers. They were hard workers on patrol and they came here to work. You get a good feeling in your heart that you're really actually helping people. You know, you're not out there locking people up every day. You know, you do actually get an opportunity to save people's lives as a police officer uh, rather than put them in jail. You know, you step downstairs and look at the truck. There's hundreds of thousands of dollars of equipment on any one of our trucks. From a machine gun to a hearse tool to, you know, a, a circular saw, I mean, home tools, anything you can think of. We never say no. If a precinct cop calls us to give them assistance, we'll never walk away from them. We have a certain uh, amount of pride in what we do, and we just would never, never refuse to help the cop do whatever it is he's asking. We're dog catchers, uh, we're EMTs, we, are, uh, we do carry medical equipment on the trucks. We also have animal control equipment on the truck. We have uh, ropes, uh, jaws of life, and other ladders and other equipment to uh, do everything to uh, rescue someone from the elevator or a vehicle or if somebody's sick and she or he can't come to the door, they call us to make entry. So that's part of our responsibility as an emergency service cop. Yeah, Sue, put your uh, you on. Jump in the, back the nature of our job is dangerous. We accept the risk because we know that we are trained and we rely on each other and our equipment. It's one of the best units in the department. Uh, it's a very special unit. It's a privilege to be in here. Uh, you know, you're an E-cop, you're an E-man. You know, you respond to all types of emergencies from, you know, uh, doing like, let's say, uh, a water rescue to a high-rise fire rescue from propelling from a helicopter. You know, we do it all. A lot of stuff we do, we do a lot of rescues. Um, just about everybody is scuba rescue qualified. Everybody's qualified as EMTs. Um, we do the search warrants. If there's jumpers up on a bridge, we go after them. A lot of times they say if, if people need help, they call a cop. And when a cop needs help, they call emergency service, which is us. As part of the police department, we are trained in, in structural rescue, which means using uh, harnesses and ropes and uh, baskets to assist any type of uh, victim uh, victim assistance at, at a, you know, at high up, either on bridges or on buildings. Everybody is cross-trained to be uh, a general emergency service officer. What the, what the specialties uh, would include are, are special equipment. In our case, uh, we have the uh, emergency support vehicle, which has, uh, a, uh, has a boat on it, has an inflatable raft with, uh, with a four or five horsepower gas engine to respond to any type of water assignments. Whenever there's something that they're not able to handle, or they need additional assistance, we're the guys that they call to do the job for them. We're there for them and for the people of this city. We support them by means of tactics, uh, by means of equipment, and by means of uh, medical uh, assistance whenever it's necessary. It's a voluntary uh, assignment. You uh, volunteer, you want to be here. Well, the training uh, that they give us is probably the best in the world. This unit is a specialty unit only in the equipment and the training that you uh, uh, are given and work with after you've been accepted into the unit. You have to be a police officer that everyone sees in the street first. You don't come into the department through the police academy right into emergency service. We all come from patrol. So it's just kicking it up a notch. You need to be a, a rational, calm, 
logical, patient individual. I think it's a calling. Not everybody can cut it. You know, people try to come in and they don't, they don't cut the mustard, so to speak. And you really enjoy this work. When you show up on a scene, it's like, wow, emergency service is here. You, they, they give you that, that respect and that confidence that the job is going to get done. I personally feel emergency service is the last defense in this city. And that's any kind of condition. You name it. We're usually one of that come out and somehow we figure out what needs to be done and we rectify the condition. The opportunity that's afforded to you in this unit allows you to have a lot of gratification, satisfaction. You know, when you leave here at the end of the day, you feel you've done something <coughs> worthwhile. To me, he was a role model and a mentor to talk to all the time. I, best time, you know, best, if I needed advice, he was always there for me. He loved everybody in his family, and he talked about them all the time. And he always had time. I'm not even in his squad. He was a friend of mine then, and he was a mentor and somebody that I go to and ask for, for situations. And a lot of my principles that I derived in uh, were from him. Listening to him talk meant a big, big thing to me. Very devastated that he's gone. All the boys, and they were all part of our lives here. We've been here, been here quite some time, seeing those guys all the time. He was a great man. As much as he took care of me, he took care of everybody he could. If there was a person on the street who needed help, he was there for that person too. He just didn't have to be an E-man. He'd help out anybody. You know already, your father is a Marine true and out, and also a good E-man. And from one E-man to you guys and Helga, uh, Mike cared about us and cared about you. Uh, it's a pleasure knowing him. We were one family, and like everything else, his eyes used to light up when we were rope training downstairs or he was cooking something, especially uh, split pea soup. He always shared that with us. Like I say, he's a good man, a good e-cop, and God bless him. Just want you guys to know that we have a family here in emergency service you know, for the rest of your lives, for the rest of our lives. Whatever you need, whatever it is, just give us a phone call and we're here. I was home, um, Kevin Reynolds, that uh, transferred out to Floyd Bennett Field teaching the emergency medical technician class call. Uh, it says turn on the television and of course we did the 4 to 12 the night before so I was quite tired and bitchy. <laughs> So I tell him, what is it? He said, turn on the television. So uh turn on the TV and I saw a gaping hole in the North Tower. I saw the second airplane hit, Tower 2. And I just clicked that we were under attack. And we all met here and tried to grab uh, all the equipment we had to go down to the World Trade. There was still dust uh, on the floor, about three or four inches, paper flying smoke still coming out from the towers. Uh, we all got to a roadway, I guess, into a building to regroup and trying to find out, you know, what happened, who's missing, try to grab equipment and start the rescue operation. We set up teams to go into those towers and areas and try to locate them. We always felt that since Mike Curtin and John DeLara been here a while. Mike was a Marine, gunny sergeant, that if they were gonna survive this, uh, it would be them. And uh, we were hoping that uh, somehow, some way, we'll get a signal from them and try to rescue them. All of the guys. Sergeant Kern and, and John DeLara, every day I think about how their route down there, they probably uh, went 126 Street down to the Henry Hudson Parkway and right down the West Side Highway as fast as they could go. And uh, that's a clear path down there. And they went into the North Tower, most likely, and then they started working. 
as emergency service officers. They didn't, they stayed with their partners, that's the most important thing, stayed with their partners to assist people, and you kind of felt that going down there, that they were, did a very aggressive job, and they stayed within inches of their partners. They were heroes that day. They saved so many people. I think about those guys every day. They had a tremendous impact on uh, Sergeant Major Curtin, Detective Vigiano, uh, John DeLaura. They all had, they're all part of me because we, all part of us because we took in everything that they say here. They just didn't exclude us. We didn't work jobs with them, but we worked in the same family of Truck 2 here. And their sayings and their ethics are part of all of us sitting at this table. We think about them all the time. We're very upset about this whole situation. Uh, they were honorable men, three of the most honorable men I've ever met, hardworking, and they would, they would do anything for anybody. And they were very professional people, and they loved their families very much. They'll always be a part of my life and all of our lives here, as well as their family's life.